All right. Well, it's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, and again, many of you are still watching us from home, so I'll look this way at the camera, not ignoring you folks over here. But there's no camera. Oh, wait, there's one way over there. There's no camera for y'all. And maybe you can form a petition where we move the camera that way, but that's okay. Um, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And it's also Mother's Day, so we're going to recognize that here in a moment. Um, and But uh, just for some thanks for the live stream, hey, just remember that uh, if you're watching us from home, let us know who's watching it. Yes, Lord. No, anyhow, sorry. If you were watching from home wondering what's going on, the lights in the house just went down. Um, so anyhow, uh, let us know who's in the live stream and how many are watching from home. And we love to have comments. Just keep them positive, and that way it's, it's nice for folks when they're reading through, they, they, they see that. Um, for those of you at home, if you still want to tithe and still are tithing, we ask that you make arrangements either with the church office or with Lori McGinnis, and that you, uh, we can, you can continue to uh, celebrate the Lord with your tithe in those matters as well. Uh, also, you know, this is Mother's Day, and, and everyone in this room and everyone at home has one. Just goes without saying, if you're, if you're alive and breathing, you all have one. And, and for, for good or bad, that, uh, when I look at, back at my life, my mom has always been a very pivotal person in, in, in my life. I love my dad dearly, and they're probably both watching on the live stream. Dad, I do love you dearly, but the one person I call the most is, guess what? It's mom. It's mom. You see this with pro sportsmen. Uh, dad will train with the kid out in the yard. He's working all late hours, and finally they win the big game, and he runs over to the camera, and he looks at the camera, and he says, we're number one, and who does he say we're number one to? Mom. mom. Sorry, dads. It's just how it goes. Uh, and, and so my mom was very pivotal in, in the formation of me as well as some other folks, and, and then I've got to see the example of my wife, Stephanie, being a mom to her children and our children, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to watch. And there's some folks that are moms, but they are not biological moms. Because all, we all know that it doesn't take any brains to, be, to make a child. However, it does take a lot to raise children. And we have spiritual moms, moms that, that have invested their lives in the spiritual growth and, the, and maturity of children who are not theirs biologically, but are theirs spiritually. We want to recognize those moms and, and the effort that they have put in in helping raise other people's children up in the Lord and the godly uh, admonition for that. So if you're at home, we want to recognize you and say thank you for all the work that you've done in raising your children and help raising other people's children. And those of you that are here in the congregation, because of the COVID-19, we're not passing anything up and down an aisle. So at the end of the service, at the back, is two baskets. I've got a handsome young man that's going to be holding one of them. And if you would just reach in and grab your gift out of the basket, that would be great. That way, the only person touching your gift is you for tithes and offerings for folks in the congregation. Pete will be at the back during the grip and grin. If you have your tithe, uh, please see Pete and put it in an offering plate. If you miss that opportunity, at the end of the service, Pete will be back there as well. Now all that admin is out of the way. Let us now begin to focus our heart and mind on why we're here. We're not here to have communication with one another. We're not here to see folks, although that's a gravy part of being in church, is the body coming together. And we're not here to talk about the events of the week, although that's the gravy part. The meat and potatoes of why we are here is to worship the one true God in spirit and in truth. We are here to corporately be together as the body of Christ. And for almost eight weeks, we were without the corporate body in the congregation. I can tell you, last week, my soul felt enormously well. Hearing, while, while it wasn't the full congregation, still hearing the folks singing praise hymns. Because I can tell you, while the praise band does a great job, it felt to me more concert because it was just me and a handful of folks than it did worship because, well, it was just me. And a few others, and we weren't, I'm, I don't sing to save anyone's life. And so it was wonderful to hear the body sing and praise. And it was wonderful to proclaim the gospel in front of the body and watch the reaction. And so we are here corporately as a body to worship the one true God in spirit and in truth. And when as Brother Raymond comes to lead us in our prayer, and as we begin to move through each section of the worship service, I want you to challenge those here and those at home. This is church. 
Our sole focus should be on the worship of the one true God, whether here or on the live stream. And our focus and our attention should be in bringing glory and honor to him. Brother Raymond. If you would bow with me. Father God, thank you so much for this morning, for this, for this chance that we have to come into your house, for this blessing that it is to be in your presence here. We thank you for these refining moments that you've given us in our lives to look back and appreciate the things that are blessings like gathering together. Uh, we thank you for the opportunities that you've given us in the past, and we thank you for the chance to look for the hope and, and promise of the future when we can gather again, either on this side of heaven or on the next. We thank you for the promises that you've given us in your Bible and the constant steady truth that we have in that. We thank you for your unchanging, unshaking love, Lord. We thank you for the hope and the faith that we have in you. And we pray for those that don't know you and the hopelessness they must feel. Father God, this morning as we come to worship and praise you, Lord, we just ask that our best and every attempt that we have to honor you that, you, that you enjoy it and embrace it, Lord. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me for today's responsive reading, please. Three and one, one and three, God of my salvation, heavenly Father, blessed Son, eternal Spirit, I adore thee as one being, one essence, one God, and three distinct persons, for bringing sinners to thy knowledge and to thy kingdom. O Father, thou hast loved me and sent Jesus to redeem me. O Jesus, thou hast loved me and assumed my nature, shed thine own blood to wash away my sins, wrought righteousness to cover my unworthiness. O Father, thou art enthroned to hear my prayers. O Jesus, thy hand is outstretched to take my petitions. O Holy Spirit, thou art willing to help my infirmities, to show me my need, to supply words, to pray within me, to strengthen me that I faint not in supplication. O triune God, who commandeth the universe, thou hath commanded me to ask for those things that concern thy kingdom and my soul. Let me live and pray as one baptized into the threefold name. Amen. All right, go ahead and uh, I guess air high five. Don't hug anybody.
All right, let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats. We are going to worship. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, this time together. We, we pray that our words that we are singing, Lord, are, are pleasing to your ears. In Jesus' name, amen. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with only thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I see for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nation with truth and justice? Shine like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I see for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Joy, all the earth rejoice. He 
wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God.
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy air, my anchor holds within. righteousness alone faultless I stand before the throne Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm who you are, Lord. We pray that you'll speak through Brother Ashley as he's about to give us your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 6 through 8. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and, every, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and then, and then there was morning the sixth day. 
and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right. Good morning. There we go. Well, we're still in Genesis. And this week we're finishing out the order of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And we now have uh, some, some really cool stuff here. Not that we didn't have cool stuff to talk about before. We have some really cool stuff to talk about now. And if you remember from last week... We have God creating. He has speaking things into existence. Now, here in a little bit, in chapter 2, when we get to chapter 2, the, the, the author of Genesis, which would be Moses, and you go, are you sure it's Moses? Yeah, it's Moses who writes Genesis. Um, he's going to put more flesh on the skeleton of how God commands things to be created. And last week I got into a conversation about grammar, and, and it got, got a, a note for many of you. It got very confusing. And that's okay, because if I had just simply made the translational shifts without justifying why I was doing it, then you would wonder why, what authority I have to change the text, which would have been confusing. Or I could have given you my evidence as to why I'm changing the text, which was still confusing. Either way I went, there was no way. It's like when your wife asked me if this dress makes me look fat. There's no safe answer for any man to answer that question. But in that, I may have also given you the impression that your English text is unreliable. And so before we get started, I'm going to do a little, little, just a little side note. When translations are made... There are what's known as translative committees. And there's an overarching committee over the Old Testament and over the New Testament, and one over all the text. And then each section, like the Pentateuch, will have its own committee. But overall, what they do, before they begin a single translation, they begin to set down the criteria for how this translation is going to be. New American Standard is going to take, their, they agree to be a more literal translation. If you read New American Standard, it was very similar to how I was breaking it down. ESV wanted to be very literal, but also have a readability concept. So that was how they went with theirs. NIV, they want to be readable. And so that's how the translated committees adopted how they broke it down. And the goal of that is to provide the pastor a palette by which then to explain the idiosyncrasies that are going on within the text. Because for them to do so, they make a Bible like that. It's called the Net Bible, and it has 57,000 different citations, and, so, and it's massive. And so the committees have opted to translate a certain way, and that allows then the pastor who should have taken Hebrew, who should have taken Greek, to go into the text and dig in mind and be able to explain beyond. So if you're wondering if your ESV is good, it's a solid text. They went for continuity. They went for let, 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 let. This week we're going to see where they should have translated it somewhere else. But they went for continuity of reading and continuity of text as opposed to the idiosyncrasies of Hebrew grammar. So hopefully that settled that issue for those of you that were wondering. And we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And, and we begin now with literally, the, as someone described, the pinnacle of God's creative act. He makes man. Now, a little bit of discussion about the concept of making man. The word man in Hebrew is the word Adam. What does the word Adam sound like in English? Adam. Yes, in Hebrew, Adam means Adam. It also means man. Ta-da. And it also means mankind or humankind. And do you know how you tell which one is meant in each passage without it saying, the Lord said to Adam? You know how you, you, know how you tell? Context. Context drives the train. If he's speaking to humanity, he will use the word Adam, but it will be translated, and he spoke to mankind, or he spoke to all of the people. If he's speaking to men, husbands, or men, 
he's using the word Adam, and he's using it to refer only to males. And then if he's calling it a man by name, and the Lord came and spoke to Adam. Now, why is that important? When we start looking at the image of God, he's going to use man. And while it means in the initial creative stage, Adam, also implied in Adam is all of humanity. This is why when the first Adam falls, all of humanity falls in Adam because all of humanity sources out of Adam. It's an interesting concept. So when we read through this, ladies, uh, he's not leaving you out. We'll talk about that here in a moment. So let's pick up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, well, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. Fellas, before you like going, hey, la- hey, baby, you might be nice. And it might be Mother's Day. But I'm made in the image of God. Some of us got, in, in that case, some of us got a little more image than some others. And some of us probably didn't. And No, that's not the case. Well, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him rule, or sorry, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, uh, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps upon the earth. Pretty much in totality, right? So let's discuss, well, first of all, when we get to this passage, we have two questions that have to be asked. First of all, who's the us? And the second question is, what's the image? And there's a lot of answers for both of those. There's a really a lot of answers that folks give for both who the us is and, and then who, who or what the image is. And here's the cool thing is Moses is writing this in such a way is that we will see, um, if you read Hebrew, you would see that there's a verbal shift. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Where Moses is signaling to the Hebrew reader, I'm about to shift away from how God has created everything to this point and shift to something that I want to draw your attention to. And let's see what he does here. It says, let us, your English text will say, let us. Uh, and up to this point, remember I said the let us was the permissive version. I gave the verbal form. It's called adjustive. It's a permissive version of a command where God's command still comes true, but it's more phrased in the permissive. This is an adjustive. They translate it as it is. It's cordive, which means it is now a verbal command. We shall make man. That's the statement. And it's signaling the author, and the author is signaling the reader in Hebrew that there is now a shift between how God has created everything up to this point, and now the shift is making done how he's making man. It's not now a permissive command that will, will come true because of who God is. It is now an active command as to what will occur, and that it will occur as God says it will occur. And it is designed so that the reader knows, hey... Something unique is coming. And notice what it says. We will make man. I mentioned Adam or mankind. He's not talking simply about Adam here. He's talking about mankind. You'll see this in a moment. In our image, after our likeness. And we will let them have dominion. What is, what, is, what is this image thing? Well, let's go back first to the we. Who is the we? Well, for some, they think that this is a conversation that God is having amongst the planets. And remember when he created, created the heavens and the earth, those are the only things that are in existence right now. And so he's having this anthropomorphic conversation with planets and earth, and, and that God is having uh, a conversation where he's consulting planets. The problem is, you, as we remember, if you remember back to the first sermon reading Isaiah 40, who does God consult for knowledge? Who counsels God? And the next event, well, he is speaking to the heavenly host, to the angels, and to, and to all of those things. Well, again, you run into Isaiah 40. Who does God gain his knowledge from? And whom does he ask how to create? It's not a conversation with angels. It's a very popular argument. Well, 
clearly, and, and up to this point, this is popular among liberals and, and atheists because they have to explain away the, the, the conclusion. The next one is the, is, the, uh, is the pluralist magisterium, which is basically the royal we. Um, and uh, you, you, we, not having a king or a queen in our nation, we really don't grasp the royal we as well as, say, if you lived in England or, or in another place that does. But we shall, maybe I guess if you were in the army, we shall all be going to the lake. Well, no, that's still not the, uh, the royal we. It's, it's the sovereign speaking for themselves in a plural. And, and, and so the king is speaking as something that he is going to do, but the nation then is going to do by default because the sovereign is doing that. And, and, and that's a very popular, very popular understanding of who the we is. The problem, though, is as Christians, especially conservative evangelical Christians, we know from John chapter 1 that Christ is involved in the order of creation. John chapter 1 makes it very clear that nothing comes into his existence that he doesn't make into existence. Chapter 1 and two and verse 1 and 2 of Genesis tells us that God the Father's there, and we assume because the Spirit of God is there, we assume that's the Holy Spirit, we, we make it the Trinitarian God. And so in the act of creation, the Trinitarian God is having a conversation about, and really it's not a conversation, it's a declaration that what is being made is uniquely different than all that has been made before. And when you will see as we go through how the image is laid out, at least from Genesis, what man has been given is uniquely different than all other events in the creative order we shall make man after our image and likeness well now that begs the question as to what image and likeness is and a lot of times especially back in the first few centuries the patristic early fathers of church history argued that image and likeness were two separate Ideas, And the reason why they did that is because of the Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament. And I won't chase that rabbit very far. Um, but essentially they linked image and likeness together. In this section of Hebrew uh, in Genesis, Moses is using words synonymously. He will use form and create synonymously. They are not two distinct manners of creation. He's using them synonymously. Here, image and likeness are synonyms and being utilized as synonyms to describe a similarity. And I left my quote on my phone over there in my bag, and I'll do the best I can to remember, remember it in another section. I may not be able to have my wife run it to me, but that's okay. It's on the bag. It literally was on the bag. It's literally, well, I'm not going to walk to you. It just dawned on me that I put the quote from my logo on my phone and not on there, and then I realized where I put my phone. Well, hey, listen, if you thought that, you know, I was perfect, um, hopefully that ended that nonsense right there, so... So anyhow, what, what does image look like? Well, for the first century Christians, they took image and likeness as two separate things. The likeness was more the spiritual nature of man. The image was more the physical nature. And you, you've heard this. Well, the image of God is that we are all bipodal. It means that we have arms and legs and we walk around on two feet. And, and that's very natural because, and this is how it goes. And there's a lot of bad philo uh, um, um, philosophical arguments around the image of God. Well... Jesus had two arms and two legs, therefore, and I have two arms and two legs, therefore, the image of God is having two arms and two legs. It's a syllogism. It's illogically inconsistent because the text tells you, actually in Genesis, tells you or gives you an allusion to what the image looks like. We just blow over it. And then the next argument comes along is that, that well, really what the image is, is it's, it's, it's part of the soul. It's kind of a, a mixture in of, of some spiritual 
things, but then because of the fall, all that's gone away, and, and the image is totally destroyed, and there really is no more image bearing within mankind. And well, the problem with that is um, the fall occurs in chapter 3, and there's a command talking about the image bearer of God being in chapter 9 and also into the New Testament, so that's hard to fall into. And then another concept of the image of God is that we are living beings because of the way God creates us, and that because of that we now have rational minds. And one of the, one of the arguments is this, is that man's uh, indelible constitution as a rational, moral, responsible being, um, and that uh, also has spiritual accord with the will of God. And I kind of like that a lot better because it accounts for all of man's totality and creation and also fits into the language of chapter 1. We, we have this capacity for administration that's been given to us at the end of this verse. And more popularly, the image of God is, well, and it, again, this is another syllogism. Well, God is relational. It comes from a guy by the name of Tim Keller. Uh, and I like Timothy Keller. He's a really good theologian and pastor. But he's, in this case, is where he's allowing tradition to blind his exegesis here. Um, man is relational. God is relational. Man is creative. God is creative. Therefore, the image of God is relational and creativity. What's well, a syllogism? The text actually gives you some windows into the, what the image is and actually does so in chapter 1. We're going to see that here in a moment. So what the image of God is, I believe that what God does is because up until this point, you see God creating in a very rational and ordered manner. You see God being an administrator over what he does. He then creates man in a unique manner. And then he gives man dominion. And dominion over things. And she began to see that the, that the image of God is that. And I think the, the, the quote out of, out, of, uh, out of this commentary is really good. Man's indelible constitution for rationality. Rationality connotes order. Because creativity connotes the fact that this is what God has done up to this point. Moral responsibility. If you are going to be have dominion, if you are going to be in charge, you have to have some form of moral accountability and moral culpability. We see the moral culpability come forward to in the in the fall, and moral culpability come about by the fall. And spiritual accord. Why? Because what separates us differently from the animals is how we are made. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So then we get into this. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, uh, he made him male and female. He created them. Now the question of this is, who is the referent of this verse? And what is this verse's main focus? It's very easy, I'm sorry, for those of you watching TV at home, you may not see this red dot, to go, well, this is talking about God and God's createdness. Well, the problem is, that language has already been used in the first six days in the creation of everything but man. But notice, you have a threefold sentence revolving around this phrase. This is in Hebrew, it's called bara. So God created, God created. He created. Well, what is it referring to? Created whom? Man. And in the image, he created him. Man. So the effort of what God is doing, again, this is designed to tell the reader, man is unique in being made. Man is not just another part of creation. Back in a, a while ago, there used to be a song that is absolutely abhorrent. And I will only give you the first couple of lines. Baby, me and you ain't nothing but mammals. And then that's as far as I'm going to go. Please don't listen to that song. Please don't listen to that song. What's the implication of that? That there is no difference between man and a bug and a creepy crawly thing. You see this in the modern evolutionary cycle in America, in America and throughout the world, that man is an invader into nature. And if we just eliminated man, nature would do well. The problem is, in Genesis chapter 1, who put man in charge? 
God does. Man is part of creation, but man is unique in his part of creation. And so to view the world that if we could just eliminate man, the world would be just this nice, homogeneous place. You have your cheese is slid off your cracker. You cannot divorce the createdness of the planet from the created being of man. Man is not outside of creation. He is actually part of creation and a unique part of creation in the fact that he's been given dominion. He's been given authority and he's been given the right to rule. Now, are there obligations in doing all those things? Absolutely there are. But notice what, what else he does. He creates man in his own image. In his own image, he created him. So it's a significant thing about being made. And then he creates what? Man and woman? Yes? Or does he create male and female? And I'm so, some of you are like going, what's the difference? Male and female are genders. In Genesis chapter 1, how many genders are made? Two. Are there any other genders mentioned? Nope. Go, well, angels are all sexual, so there's a third gender. If if you want to really make that argument, okay, great. Um, No. In the creative narrative, he creates two genders amongst human beings. Male. And if you need me to tell you what it means to be a male... Just look down, preferably not in the room. And if you're a female and you need me to tell you what it means to be a female, look down, preferably not in this room. And that distinguishes male and femaleness, whether you feel like it or not. So where in the Bible does it say there are only two genders? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. That's it. God creates us. In two genders. Now, why is this important? Because when the fall comes and the perversion of the image, this is one of the parts where we pervert the image. Because now there's something like 300 and something genders, according to the, the, the folks in, in our society. According to God, there's only two. He creates them. Well, how does he make man? Well, you're going to have to bounce to Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. Then the Lord God formed man from dust. By the way, when it says formed, God does not have arms and legs where he is like making man. He's, he's still speaking man into existence. He's using the term form. You put the word created there. It's synonymously being used. He formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living creature. And the Lord planted man in the garden. And it's interesting. The Lord planted man in the garden. There's a pun in the text there. Did you catch it? Because a garden usually is full of plants that are planted. You see, the, it's kind of cool. They actually kept the Hebrewism there. It's kind of neat. In the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. By the way, in Hebrew, when there's a, a lot of repetitiveness, it's there for a reason. So let's see what he does. Well, he makes man from the dust of the ground. He also, as we will read when we get over to chapter 2, he also makes all the animals from the dust of the ground as well. But he makes man uniquely different. Notice what we have. We have three things that what God does with man. He forms him. He breathes into him. And then man becomes a living creature. Now, when God makes the animals, they become a living creature by the fact that he makes them. Man is formed, but yet man is not alive yet. He's made. He's a shell. He's made in an image. And then God does something unique that he does not do to the animals of the world. God breathes into man. The breath of life. He makes man live through the breath in through his nose. And in so doing, man becomes more unique than all the animals because nowhere in the text is recorded that God breathes into the nose of any animal. 
He breathes into man the breath of life. There in itself is the image of God. We're made uniquely in the fact that God breathes into us the breath of life. Well, what does that look like? Well, we'll see that here in a moment. And then man becomes a living creature is one way to translate it. You could also translate that word, and there's a big discussion in the lexicon between the creatureliness of the created and the creatureliness of man, that man becomes a living soul. And what makes us unique from the animals is that we possess a soul. And I know there are a lot of folks that believe that there are dogs in heaven. I'm going to help you out right now. I can murder a man, but I can't murder an animal. And we'll see that in a moment. I can slaughter every animal on the face of the earth, and I have not committed one ounce, one ounce of murder. But if I think an evil thought about another individual, the, the image of God is so much that I've murdered them in my mind. That's the difference between animals, which we eat, and they are tasty, and humans, which we should never eat because they're not. No, that's not the reason why we don't eat people. We don't eat them because they're made in the image of God. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So the contention that I would put forth, and I've argued for when I was going through the book of Genesis uh, in, in seminary, is that what happens here is because of the breath of life, there's something more than just the creatureliness of man being made. The man, this is when man develops and gets his soul, and we, all the image bearers possess a soul because of the unique way in which we come into the world. And it's kind of cool. Let's use the analogy of birth. Now, again, the child is alive and breathing in the womb, but every parent, when a child is born, that anxious moment when the child comes out, what does every parent long to hear? And then we pray, it shuts up. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I love my kids dearly. Anyhow, but uh, so... But that's how we, and for the longest time, that's how we define life. If you could breathe, you were alive. And then we began to realize that babies were breathing within the womb, and then we realized that they were actually uh, babies within the womb, and understood they had all the parts that made them the image of God in the womb, and science has enabled us to help see that child in the womb. But that was one of the arguments between living and dying, was that you could breathe, and when we realized that that wasn't all that was there, what made man unique was that God made us in his image. And so, but you go, well, what about, what about Genesis 2.19? Well, what does Genesis 2.19 say? Well, I'm glad you asked, because right there it is. Look at there. In Genesis 18, this is the first time this phrase is used in all of creation. Then, therefore, the Lord said, it is not good. First time he's ever declared something to be not good. And what is it? That man be left to his own devices. And so what did he do? He made women. And ever since then, we've never known what to wear. Robert, where were you on that? There you go. But that's okay, ladies. You doom us all into damnation because you didn't know where you wanted to eat. So let's, let's. It is not good that man should be alone. So I'll make for him a helper fit for him. And we'll talk about that fully when we get there. Now out of the ground, the Lord, for now, see, here's the thing is now out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and brought them and every one of them became a living creature. Same word. And what is going on in the, in the lexicon is a discussion between life in the blood and which that's what the argument is for animals. They are unique in the fact that they have, they are alive, but their life is really contained within their blood. And man being unique because God breathes into man the breath of life. Therefore, you could make the translative argument that man is a living soul. And, and, and one of the argumentations they use for this is jumping all the way over to chapter 9. This is the next instant of the image of God is used. And he speaks about eating flesh. You shall not eat the flesh, talking about animals, with its lifeblood in it. Um, He's not talking about eating a nice, medium-rare to rare steak. He's talking about like eating it while it's freshly killed or just died or even still alive. I don't know if many folks that do that. Um, but anyhow, and for you, uh, sorry, and for you, your lifeblood will require a reckoning from every beast. It will require it from. Every man. From its fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Now, notice what it says. You shall not eat the, blood, the meat of an animal with blood in it. 
And there will be a reckoning for that. But notice what it says in verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man, his blood will be shed. Do you see the distinction between the creatureliness of animals and the creatureliness of man? This is why I made the statement earlier. I can murder every, I can kill every animal on the face of the earth, and it is not murder. It is poor stewardship, it's poor dominion. But I have not committed a single act of murder. And people are go, I know there's some of you on home watching TV go, but my dog, it's like a member of the family. Does it possess the image of God? No. Then it's not a member of your family. They're food rations when the grid goes down. Why? Man's made unique. Man is made unique. You can eat an animal. You can't kill a man. Christ up the ante with this when he says, if you've thought in your head, you fool, you've committed murder in your heart. Christ ups the ante on this. It's not simply just simply murdering an individual. And this then extends to us how then we are to treat other individuals. And so we get back to, well, what's, what's this image of God looking like? I'm going to jump over that slide, Billy. That's okay. Notice what it says, and then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the seas, the birds of the heavens, and every living creature upon it. So one of the concepts of the image of God is that we possess dominion. We've been made the, 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 the caretakers of the world. Uniquely different than all of, all of crea- 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 creation and nature. I'm trying to blend two words together there. Sorry, my dyslexia was getting me. And in so doing, to do so in a, in a good manner, we have rules that God gives us uh, later on in the text. One of those is, is the law code given in the Ten Commandments. The first five of those are relational with God or, or man to God, and the remainder is man to man. And in so doing, there's a way in which we are to live an obedient and holy life. Now, it's very easy to go, well, God's relational and God's creative, therefore the image of God is that. Well, God is also holy and God is loving. The image of God could be that. I think the text leaves it obnoxiously vague for a reason. Because if we could define what the image was, we could find a way to subvert how we can misuse the image. Whereas if we understand that the image is that all men and all women and all children are living things that are uniquely different than every other created being in the world. And that's why you don't kill them because God made us unique and that's the image itself. I think we would live a better life with one another. Because we love justifying. The difference between things. We make an order of merit on how we like certain things. Many of you, if you're going out to eat today, some of you will have an OML, an order of merit list, on where you're going to eat. And you've got it in your head. And your wife, she has a different OML. And you know this because when you ask her, where do you want to eat? She's going to say, I don't know. I don't care. I swear, I'm going to open a restaurant in clean called I Don't Know and I Don't Care, so all you men know where to take your wives. It's problem solved. But the uniqueness of man is demonstrated in the creative order. We are presented with dominion. Well, does that dominion mean I can do whatever I want to to all the creatureliness of the earth? Yeah, if you want to live a very short life. Just like, while I have dominion over the house as the, as the husband of the house, I also have obligations to my wife. And while, and while I have dominion over how I rule the house, that I have obligation to my children. I also can spend all the milk money if I wanted to. But then, being a large man, I like to eat. And if there's no money, then I have to deal with the consequences for that. And so, while you are given authority over a thing, how one rules with that authority is governed by the requirements of what God has for our holy man. And notice what he tells us to do then. He tells us to then be fruitful 
and multiply. That's kind of a cool statement. For those of you younger than adults, what your parents will tell you. To what? Fill the earth. So the argumentation we have too many people living upon the earth and the earth is going to die is an erroneous belief because if we're to fill it, we are to fill it. What else are we to do? Subdue it and have dominion over the fish. Now, here's where the argument from environmentalism is, is, is managed from the outside. To have dominion over what? Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the living things that move upon the earth. Did he leave anything out? Nope. The totality of all of creation has now been placed under the dominion of man for his uh, ability to rule and maintain. And you see this with the job that God gives Adam in the garden. He tells Adam, here are all the animals, now you name them. And that's what Adam does. Because that's part of his job which has a lot to go back to what his image looks like. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant. Now, see, he gigs this one further. Every plant yielding its seed on the face of all the earth, and every tree and its seed and its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth and, and, and every bird of the heavens and everything that creeps and crawls upon the earth and everything that has breath, I've given you every green plant. Now, at this point in the game, what are all? Everything on the earth, or what is everything on the earth? They're vegan. They're vegan. They're not eating each other. They're literally eating plants. I don't think I could cut it. Me love me some bacon. I'm glad that I live post flood because that's when we get to eat meat. Um, or actually, yeah, and so I'm, I'm kind of glad for that because. I like my bacon. But up until this point, man is eating all the plants, and so are all the animals. Why? Well, because in the garden, you have perfect peace and perfect harmony. You would have disharmony if the lion is eating everything around itself. So it's eating the plants. But notice that everything in the garden, everything is good, and everything is for them to eat. Unique nature in which man is created. Now, and there's my slide. I know, Billy, I'm messing up your slide thing. That's okay. You'll be fine. You'll get over it. I do these things. For the people at home, I do these things. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. Is that what that verse says? Yes? God saw that he was made and everything and it was good. It was very good. It's the first time this expression is used. So let's take a look. Now, Billy, we'll be on that slide. It's the last slide, too, I can tell you right now, except for the blank one. God saw all that he had made. Now, on the sixth day, he made all the things that crawled upon the earth, and he made man, and he made man in his own image, and he saw that all that he had made in the image of God was good. Translate that roughly from the Hebrew. Good exceedingly. In English, we would smooth it up by exceedingly good or great. Notice the language again shifts to the way the, 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 the creation day concludes. There is more information about the day of creation for man than there is for any other thing created. It is exceedingly good. Now why is this language here? Because the fact that you presuppose the creation of humanity in one man named Adam, who also means the general name for man, which also presupposes the general name for humankind, you also have to presuppose a second Adam. And just so as the fall is coming in chapter 3 and in chapter 2, you begin to see the movement in that direction, so too you have the fall of man. And all of this thing, this thing that God had made, this image bearer of God that he declares is very good in the fall is shattered. 
And depending on how you approach salvation theology, you will determine how you look at the damage done to the image of God. Being more from the, from the Reformed tradition, I will tell you that the image of God is totally decimated except for a small remnant. And it's in Christ that that remnant is beginning to be rebuilt back into the very image and likeness of God in which he made. And we see this as we look forward into the New Testament and as we begin to understand salvation that after the fall, there were, as you look throughout all of history, men do all sorts of of vile and unspeakable and unnatural things to other image bearers because they can. And then when we understand salvation history and understand how Christ has brought back the understanding of that image, we see and look and the shame and horror, even within our own biblical understanding of how we have treated other image bearers and how we have treated the mistreatment of other image bearers. And we look back throughout our own history and as we understand more and more about the image and how more and more of that is being restored, we look back in absolute horror at times as when good godly people did ungodly things. A great example is during the Reformation, you had a group known as the Anabaptists. Anna means to re- Baptist means to baptize, and then baptism, it means to dunk. Well, what Zwingli would do is he would take the Anabaptists and he would baptize them a third time by tying weights around their ankles and push them off a bridge into a river and see how long they like being re-baptized. Many of your reformers did that. Godly men that wrote godly things that did ungodly things to the image bear, fellow image bearers of God because they disagreed with baptism. Aren't we glad we live in a more civilized day today, right? We, we would never, we would never do that today. We see the restorative work of Jesus Christ to the damaged and, and pulverized image of what man is. We begin to see, because of the work of Christ, how that uniqueness that was made in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to the end, through 31, and in 2, 6, and 8. We see that uniqueness, and then we have this heart-breaking history. The Bible records that even God's people treated fellow image bearers in a horrifically ungodly manner. And we see the coming of Christ bringing a restoration to that very damaged and broken image. To where now we can look back and we are heartbroken. Not simply over the sins that are in the past, but heartbroken over the sins in which we have lived in fellowship and relationship to one another as fellow image bearers. And realize that all of us bear the image. And then we look at the absolute holocaust in American history. Where we have murdered the image bearer in its womb, in its mother's womb. For the sake of convenience. For the sake of career. And you can tell me all you want that there are other issues that are just as important. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, while equal pay is important, murdering an individual from Genesis chapter 9 requires the, 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 the forfeiture of the life of the one that commits the murder. God takes striking the image of God at a higher level than he does all the other social issues we want to pull into it. Matter of fact, when he gives the law, he prescribes manners to where if you swing in an axe and you hit a man and you kill him, you die. But if you're swinging an axe and accidentally the head flies off and it hits a man, well, it's manslaughter, and he allows for cities of refuge for you to get your butt to so their kin can't kill him. And he delineates between those two strikings of the image. He also delineates what happens when two men are fighting and they hit a woman who's pregnant, and the baby dies. He takes that 
smacking the, the image or striking the image it's very seriously. And a lot of times what we do in contemporary cycles, especially uh, in modern day Christianity, is, well, that's one of many issues. Folks, when you can murder children at will, you can do anything else to other image bearers and it will not matter. And we as believers who now understand the importance of what the image have, have an obligation, not simply to end that, but recognize the restorative nature of Christ's work to the image. And we have an obligation to take the good news of that restorative work that God brings to the image of God and take that message of hope that there is a plan for humanity who has fallen and is in rebellion to God, to a restorative nature and fellowship with God through salvation through Jesus Christ, which then begins to restore the fellowship of the image and the damaged image the man has. You're here today, and you'd like to know more about what happens to this damaged image. And we're going to talk more about this as we get to Genesis chapter 3 and, and into chapter 2. I'd love to sit and talk to you more about what it means to have a restored image and what goes into the restoration of the image. You're, you're at home watching this, and you have questions that, that I might have raised. Hey, listen, uh, contact the church through, 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 through instant message, and, and, and some of, one of us will get back involved with you on that and answer that question for you. I ask the praise band cl- close us out. If you will stand and sing with us, please. to be in the house of the Lord today. So if y'all be seated, we have some folks that said we'd like to join the church this morning. So if you're watching at home, you know, pay attention, you can't come by and shake their hands, but you can reach out to them on Facebook. So we have, many of you may know who this family is. 
you have kids in the nursery, you should know who one of these people are. And if you've been paying attention on the live stream, we know who the other guy is because he plays the bass, right? We were bassless for the song, weren't we? Yeah. So we had no basis for the song because... Sorry, we had no bass. Yeah, so the song was bassless. Was. I got you. <laughs> you were debased. Yeah, we were debased. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, we can go on like this for hours. This is the Olander family. This is Ryan and Hannah, and they have asked to join our congregation uh, while they're here uh, as he's serving in the military. And so all of God's people said, Amen. there we go. We need to get a few shift out some information here in a moment. But folks, um, those of you on the live stream, you, you can't come by and say hi, but at least do a shout out on the, on the live stream and we'll all see that. Uh, but for the rest of you, if you wouldn't mind coming through, social distancing and extend the right elbow of Christian fellowship. Not to the rib cage, and, and welcome this new family into our congregation, Brother Raymond. Will you close us out with a word of prayer? Yes. 